that she'll figure it out. And if she can't, then she can just look at the meeting minutes or at the, the uh, okay. whatever later. We are recording. Is that what makes the quorum, though? Do we still have a quorum? I see a mic on for Delia. Can you hear us, Delia? She can hear us. Okay. Good, good. So, are we recording now? Yes, we are. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to the March meeting. It is 10.08 on the 19th of March. We're starting this meeting. Let's go ahead and call it to order. Um, Perry, did you say we had a uh, quorum today? With everybody yeah, actually, in here. seven out of uh, thirteen. Okay. So we have we have fifty four percent. Okay, good. All right. So in attendance today we have Beth Longwell. Actually, Beth, what is your new last name? I keep forgetting. It's Ross. Ross, thank. You. That's actually easier to remember. I don't know why I can't remember that. Uh, so Beth, Ross, and Dia Delia. Uh, Deneen, John, Kathy, Maggie, Mark, Marsha, Mary, Reeser, Perry, Rachel, and myself. We do have a quorum today, so we can get things done. Um, let's go ahead and did, did everybody have a chance to look at the meeting minutes for January? Is there anybody who's not prepared to vote to either approve, disapprove, or change the meeting minutes today? I did find a typo. Okay. Here's my... Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Um, <laughs> yeah. Under budget draft review, um, first paragraph, the last line, charge my change. It should be charge may change. Okay. Good eye. <laughs> Auto correct. I... I can make that change. Um, do we want to um, to vote um, with the understanding that that change would be made? This is Kathy. I move we approve the minutes with the um, proposed change. I'll second it. This is Dio. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That must be a no. All right. Okay. I have one quick question. Um, did we appoint uh, Marsha on the council? Yes, we did. And what what um, was that replacing Jackie Ray, BMCC? Yes, it was. Okay, got it. Well, that improves our uh, quorum status to 61.5%. And I don't know, do we need to do a specific reach out to Jennifer Costley um, to replace Mary? Vinny, because Mary retired. Yeah, we probably do. Um, I know Mary had made the indic uh, had asked if Jennifer could take her place on the council, and we've done that in the past. Um, so if the council is is okay with that, we can reach out to her. Was was um. This is Kathy. Was Marsha's appointment in the November minutes? I did see it somewhere. I don't remember which which one. Okay, great. Thanks. I'll let Beth send it and get back. Real quick, Beth, somebody just came back and said that uh, the person from the Josephi Library is trying to log into the meeting and he did not get the login for it. Um, does anybody have his email address? I do. I do. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't have anything up on that screen yet. I could put the agenda back over there, but it's... 
basic. So is that better? I don't I don't have a lot to share. So Perry does the budgets and and Beth usually has things to share. But I just had the basic agenda that I sent out this morning. Um, all right. Did anybody have any additions they wanted to make to the agenda today? Um, I do. I wanted to give a systems update and um, okay. also wanted to, um, I think we should talk about the budget. Okay. Don't we need to uh, approve the budget? Um, we do if the if the council is ready for that approval process. It it does need to happen either during our meeting today or by email. Okay. Well, uh, do you guys just want to work through the reports, and we can do those things when we get to those sections? Except for the systems update, there's nothing on there for systems, but Beth can talk about that when she'd like to. And Cheryl put a note in the chat that she would like to talk about Burns High School as well. Oh, yes. Thank you, Cheryl. I didn't hear and back from... Yeah, go ahead. Perry also put a note in the chat about... Uh, a link to the budget for everybody to take a look at if you haven't had a chance to renew it since the last time we talked or to review it since the last time we talked about it. Oh wait, I think I might have gotten the wrong link. Sorry, let me fix that. <laughs> that was to last year's. Oh yeah. So Beth, do you want to go ahead and talk about the systems update first? Since uh, yes, um, just I have a couple things. Um, one that keyword searches are working better now that um, we restarted um, our database and um, did some operating system um, upgrades on the database server. So that's a success story. We're very happy about. Um, the second thing is that we have the opportunity, John and I, to get trained um, by Equinox on doing minor upgrades, and uh, we now have a date for that minor upgrade, and what they're going to do is they're actually going to upgrade our system to 3.1.10 um, while John and I are watching, um, so we'll get an upgrade out of the um, training as well and that will fix things like uh, not being able to use the web client on a mobile browser so iPads will um, be able to log into the web client that kind of thing so and there's also other bug fixes that we're going to get as a result of that upgrade and uh, we still get to continue using the desktop client and the web client um, um, both of them um, since we're not upgrading to 3.2. So oh, you said you had a date? Are you yes. Ready to share that? Yes. Um, that date um, is April 10th. It's a Wednesday. He said the upgrade should only take an hour. Um, right now we've got it scheduled at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, so hopefully that won't um, cut into anybody's uh, patron time. You know, um, there will be some staff time impacted, but our hope was that patrons wouldn't experience very much downtime at all. So I guess um, with that announcement, are there any objections from the council? No, as long as we get to keep the desktop client, because I'm loath to give that up yet. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, yeah, we're we're not quite ready, and so um, that's why this is just a minor upgrade and uh, gets us some experience um, with doing upgrades. So anyway, I'm um, I'm excited about it. Is there a particular reason you're aware of why the web client does not seem to work on any of the web browsers except Google Chrome? on any of our computers here? Um, it works on Google Chrome and it works on Firefox. Yeah, and when I've used it on Firefox though, I get like the bars, but I don't get any of the the actual content below the the toolbars, if you will. Uh, okay, I think we'll have to troubleshoot this, um, Ryan. There, there have been some people that have had specific issues there's some yeah. settings that had to be changed. Okay. Um, with Baker, you had a firewall issue, right, Perry? Perhaps, yeah. yeah. I don't. I and think and it works fine. On, it works fine on Chrome, and we have Chrome on all the computers. I was just wondering if it was really only working on Chrome or if it was a, an issue. So. And Zwelke asks if uh, it will work on. Apple Max. Yeah. Which I don't. It will. Okay. Um, I mean, I'll have to double check. Um, I don't know that they're using the Safari browser with the Evergreen web client. Um, but if you can install um, Chrome or Firefox on the Apples, there shouldn't be any problem. So the you said. Part of the keyword fix was upgrading the, um, the operating system. Um, the operating the operating system of the server itself, not the not our Evergreen software, um, just the Linux software that our database server. And yeah, I, I ran updates. Yeah. So. Um, and and those updates were a lot of them were security fixes and and uh, just regular Linux upgrades. Um, right, John? Yes. Yeah. Cool. This is Deneen in Enterprise. And I was trying to use the web one, and um, it might just be our internet, though we have the best you can get here. So it was it was fine, except for if I had a stack to check in and check out. There's like a 20-second delay between the record actually being scanned and showing up on the screen so I can go on to the next record. So it just wasn't usable for me. Now, I don't know if that's just our problem, but um, I would love to use web client, but it we had that lag time. Um, I guess we'll have to reach out to other users um, of the web client, Deneen, to see if that is a... Um, common issue. I hadn't heard about it before, but I haven't been using the the web client to check in um, several materials at the same time. Well, and I um, I don't, well, yes, I would have had to use Google Chrome to get in there, so, hmm, okay. This is Kathy. We haven't tried out web client because I feel very, un I just don't know what I'm doing with it at this point, but um, one concern I have after going to special districts training this year and hearing about cybersecurity, which is why I reached out to Perry to see what our coverage was, is if individuals are using web client on laptops, perhaps they work from home or perhaps they're going somewhere and those aren't protected securely with passwords and that laptop got stolen, um, the web client on the laptop could be a security breach um, of somebody to find a lot of personal identifiable information of our patrons. So I, I wonder if we need to, um, in the future, look into policy stating how we will um, attempt to, you know, say this is the steps you need to take to prevent that kind of um, event happening.
Well, I think, Kathy, um, requiring secure passwords is is uh, at least one of those steps. Um, yeah, making, uh, making having people do. use their personal laptops, I feel, is is a it would be a, a opportunity for uh, or a, a library issued equipment. I think it's maybe um, an option also. Are are you concerned about personal laptops not having enough? Um... Well, I just think like if you say I have an employee that wants to work from home, and um, they ha they don't have a library issued laptop, they have a personal laptop, which then the other people in their family all use, and they don't take the security measures that you do at work. So that's why I think we need to look into maybe a policy that states. If you are, you know, outside of your building using this, be sure, da, 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 da. I don't know. Maybe I'm not making sense, but I just got really nervous about the whole idea. Well, I remember a few years ago, we were all required to provide new passwords for our accounts that had to meet certain minimum requirements. So if you're not Correct. meeting the certain minimum requirements on your evergreen that's a problem that needs to be addressed at your personal libraries. No, I think um, we are meeting those requirements. Well, I just then, worry that people get excited now because they're like, oh, it's a web client. I could do this at different locations. Um, yeah. So we maybe need to lock down the, you know. Well, and, and there's another piece of it too, Kathy, and, and this is true for both the staff client or the desktop client and the web client. You can set it so that you're, you don't have to continue to enter your password every time either. So if you don't have um, a system that is set up and secured, then you're right. It could be a very Correct. big breach. And that's where I think Sage itself needs to maybe look at our policy for that and, and um, tighten it up if needed. Oh, yeah, we can look at drafting a policy. Um for use of the web client. Uh, for securing use of the web client. Yeah. Well, and I don't even know if it has to be specific towards the web client, but just in general, because some of those same issues are available on the other side, because what's to say that a person couldn't right. download the staff client at home it's, either? And that's right, Dia. Those are the things that so Maybe it's, nervous while I sat it's, on, it's, it's all the way across the board, Kathy. It's not just with the web client, but correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Well, besides the policy, does Evergreen have a way to enforce, to require a strong password? Reject weak passwords. I mean, I, I've, we've talked about this security of passwords before and it being up to the individual libraries, but I don't think there's, we have really a, an effective uh, checking system, a verification system in place to make sure that all the staff accounts have a strong password. Yeah, right. yeah, unless we assign them ourselves, um, which we've been hesitant to do. Um, but I can look into that, Perry, and see if there is a way we can force <coughs> strong passwords on Evergreen. Mm -hmm. And I, I apologize for going off agenda. Oh, no. We were asking for new business. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, on that same note, I just posted a link to the uh, insurance portion, uh, insurance policy portion, which covers cybersecurity breaches in case there was one. Um, Baker has a policy which has a million dollar coverage as part of general liability. <clears throat> um, uh, for a first party data breach, there's a hundred thousand dollar coverage, and I think this is per incident. Um, so I don't think we can buy additional coverage, is what I heard. That's the, the coverage that comes with our current policy. Hmm. 
and that covers sage or uh, yeah okay. covers sage since sage is um, a department of baker basically okay, okay. interesting it was it was just a huge emphasis this year at special districts association and several of us that were there that are library directors were like oh never thought of this that much before um one of the things they brought up was if your system was hijacked and held hostage um, for bitcoin which was just on the news today for some aluminum plant and then um the other one was if you use an a online credit card taking in, um, like square perhaps um if that if square was hacked they don't only go after the square the square type company they also come after the location where the money was taken so if it was sage that was using square to accept payments then um then that would be a third party we, we would be called the third party that would be liable uh, open to lawsuits Um, John did a look up on the um, password format, um, being able to, um, I guess, be more restrictive. Right now, the um, if we set it, um, the default requires that the password be at least seven characters in length, contain at least one letter and at one number. Um, that would affect um, patron passwords as well. Mm -hmm. Do we have an issue with at least enabling that? Um, it would force the, the patrons to be more secure in their passwords as well. I think we would have an issue with that, but we may have to do it anyway. Well, it seems like at some point, of course, I don't get into my patron account very often. This is Dia. Um, but I know at some point I had to do something to add to mine years ago because it wasn't secure enough, if, if you will. Um, so at some point we must have had something like that turned on because I know I had to add a digit or something. Yeah. Do all of the branches have hardware thinking? firewalls, John asks. We do in Legrand. I wouldn't expect some of our smaller libraries to be super. We do uh, in, in Oregon Trail. Yeah, probably. And like we were saying, if someone's working from home, that could be an issue too. All right. Maybe we need to have a, a training for cybersecurity for SAGE, a required training with minimum requirements for them to have firewalls in place. Yeah. So is this at each library site they would need um, a minimal firewall? Is that what you're specifying, Perry? Well, doesn't it go beyond that? I mean, it's, it's, um, on whatever device they're accessing the Sage uh, admin. Um, oh, true. Client yeah. from. Yeah, yeah. So if they're if they are doing it home, I, I I don't know that there's that many people who are doing it from home. Um. So I was wondering. Or outreach. I mean, we use a laptop when we go do outreach and sign up people with library cards. We take our piece our that our laptop with us and well John is suggesting the possibility of establishing VPNs when you're doing remote work um, well he also was saying that um, Ant untangle is a good free option yeah Yeah, I used to use it all the time. I, I now use the uh, Unify one, but um, the Untangle is a real simple and easy to set up. So. 
So I think we do have uh, opportunity here for uh, some training and some enforcement um, for, for security. I think it's a big need. Uh, you're right. Um, so we'll continue looking at this and um, and look at um, what we might be able to use for a training and then what recommendations or requirements um, that we want to uh, to put forward. Do we want to schedule a time um, for this? I mean, do we want to have this? I guess I don't want to leave it open-ended so it, it doesn't get done, um, but I also want to give us enough time to to act on it. Do you want to do a, an email survey vote to figure out dates and times for meeting? For something? Well, and I'm wondering, too, if we need to do more than one training. Um, because I'm afraid you're not going to be able to get all staff be able to attend one specific time. Well, and I don't know. Excuse me, Perry, did you have something in mind for the, the training? Um, have you used something in the past? Or I guess I'm wondering if there's something out there that we could just post a link um, for, for folks to watch and then somehow give us feedback on um, the fact that they've actually watched it. So we have verification. Yeah, I did not have anything in mind in particular, but you're right, we do need verification. And if we can trace a breach to a member, those members should know that they're going to be liable for the lawsuits under their policy as well. So maybe that'll be an, a good incentive for them to actually implement the security measures. Yeah. Well, and I would think you'd want that in the policy for sure. Okay, well, between now and the um, next council meeting, what we can do is we can research trainings that are already out there and um, also um, look at uh, policies that maybe other libraries and uh, library groups have written um, on this so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and uh, maybe come up with something that could be tailored to SAGE specifically. How does that, that sound? That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. And Marcia made the suggestion that maybe it should either be an annual thing, or I think it should just be something that could be done online on your own, possibly. That way, new staff could do it as they come in in the libraries. So. Um, and it may be something that. Um, a similar to the MOU, um, libraries need to sign. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of it's common sense. Don't use your dog's name as your password because anybody who knows your dog is going to be able to figure it out. Um, well, it's <laughs> what worries I, me is more we're gonna, than that. But yeah, we have we do have some uh, staff rotation with our various member libraries. Mm -hmm. When somebody's no longer working for SAGE, uh, what verification is there that they're not retaining access, administrative access to the system? Yeah, my, fe my feeling is if a staff member leaves, the password should be changed, um, the staff, at least the um, accounts that they had access to. Absolutely, but do we have any way administratively and not de not depending on the member libraries to handle that. No, we would well, Yeah, go ahead. The other piece is we don't always even know when people leave. Right. I mean, we found that with catalogers, so um, I would think, it, you know, as turnover happens, um, 
Yeah, I don't know, what, maybe you need to write that into policy as part of the MOU or something as well, that this would be a responsibility of each site. I mean, with cataloging um, logins, once I'm informed that they have left, I, I do um, delete their account. Um, but for circulation, um, everybody's using a common account, so. Right. And that password should be changed once a year, at least. Yes. So these are all good things to put in the policy. Yeah, I think we do need a an independent Sage security requirements policy. This is Deneen and Enterprise, and this is entirely off the subject, but Perry, where are you posting the link for the budget? It's in the chat. It's up several quote-unquote pages at this point. He posted it twice, the second one. Okay, the, thank you. Yeah, use yep. the second one. All right. This, this is a good topic to, to, to bring up. Thanks, Kathy. Well, then You're surely welcome. there's other I, Evergreen libraries and consortiums that have wrestled with oh, this. Yeah. So maybe it's something I'm that sure. the Evergreen and all community those people in special buy. districts are having to create a policy too. So we could maybe take something from there. All right. Does anybody else have any discussion for this at the moment, or are we? Are we at a stopping point? All right. So uh, we'll figure out where we want to go next. Beth, were you going to look for policies? and? Yes. Um, we're going to look for possible trainings and uh, possible um, policies, but um, anyone um, can um, I, put forward suggestions as well. Okay. I'll do that a little bit too. So, okay. But we can discuss it via email or at the next SAGE meeting. Um, Perry, do you want to talk about the budget right now, or do we want to just go through the the reports and do the budget when we get to the budget? Committee? Yeah, let's let's come back to the budget. Do the okay. reports first. Okay. So, do we have a cataloging committee meeting recently? I know we had some cataloging training recently. So. Yes, we did have a cataloging committee meeting, and um, I asked John to give me a summary. And I'm just bringing that up um, right now. Okay. Okay. Um, cataloging mentors meeting was held on February 6. Um, it was the decision was made that their uh, mentor meetings will now be held the last Wednesday of the month. Um, we the mentors talked about new bib reports. Um, uh, talked about series documentation and guidelines. Um, we were reviewing the last draft and uh, and then they drafted the co cataloging committee meeting agenda. Cataloging committee meeting was held on February 11th. Um, uh, per polling results, the cataloging committee meetings will revert back to the first Monday of every even numbered month. And so the next meeting is April 1st. Um, the, we talked about uh, the mentor reviewing new records created by Sage catalogers. Um, and we uh, reported that the degrees of cataloging experience and ability vary across Sage and some catalog catalogers are being contacted as their records consistently fail to meet SAGE standards. Um, many catalogers are open to support and training, 
but those who aren't that aren't might require a downgrading of privileges as a last resort. Um, committee was encouraged to contact mentors with difficult cataloging questions or situations. Um, series documentation, the committee members received new comprehensive guidelines for series cataloging in SAGE. This was a big effort and it will help uh, improve the quality and consistency of new records. Um, trainings have been scheduled. Um, there is a, a training coming this Thursday for series. Um, at one o'clock. Um, we've created a, a spreadsheet for things uh, for required cleanup of series information, either series that are incomplete or series that are just so difficult um, they need help. Um, so um, I need to post that spreadsheet. I don't know that it's been sent out to um, the cataloging committee. Um, it's just been sent out to the mentor, so I'll do that. All right, and a special training session on the web client cataloging module was held on Friday, March 8th. And so that's the end of the summary. Any I went to that meeting. It was very helpful. Yeah, it's it's a lot of it's question and answer. Um, so it's, it's just so many. loose format, but at least we're um, all getting experienced on it. So um, yeah. it's helpful. Um, there yeah. will be another circuit. Well, that's a d different committee. Yeah. So I think that's just it for the cataloging committee. OK, just learning how to do things in the web client, because there are some things that are very similar, and there are some things that are just drastically different, at least in appearance. Um, so. Ryan, is that your headphone making that hand rubbing sound? That might actually have been my hands making that hand rubbing sound. <laughs> it makes it hard to understand what you're saying sometimes. Uh, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> our, our, our heater in the staff area of our building has been a little funky lately, and it's been getting into the low 60s. Oh, and burr. My fingers cold. I didn't realize okay. my microphone was quite so sensitive. So, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'll I'll stop doing that for a while. Um, did anybody have any questions for cataloging committee stuff? For Beth about approximately anything? what number of libraries are there that uh, are problematic? Um. I'd say we have three or four that are consistently having um, issues with the same common mistakes. Um, we are going to be, um, I'm going to be going out and doing some training um, and uh, we're taking a couple months to make sure that we have a good list of things that we need to address with the with the catalogers and then we're going to be pursuing training either online or in person do they know we talked about this last year at the same time do those libraries that you have the few do they know that they are making problems are they aware that there's an issue yet or are you waiting till you physically go in person to talk to them um, I would say it's mixed. Some of them have gotten um, uh, the uh, the spreadsheet notes sent to them, and others have not. Um, so I think what we wanted to do was make sure that we had a good arsenal of examples. I guess I'm just wondering, is it the same ones that last year at this time that we said? and it's been a whole year and it's still an issue, or is it those ones have corrected and now it's new ones? Hmm. I'd say by and large it's the same ones. Hmm. 
So for me, that's that's frustrating that the same ones are still having the issue, and it's been over a year. That must be really hard for the mentors and you to deal with. A lot of work. It is. Um, our hope was that um, by doing having more frequent online trainings and having those trainings available online would correct some of the issues. And so that's what we've been working on in the past year. Um, but I think what we've discovered is that not everybody takes the time to view the trainings and or well, they just don't have the time um, because of work responsibilities. So um, that's why we're having to pursue another approach. I mean, I still think it's a good idea to continue those trainings and, and have them available for folks um, because people, there, there will be a lot of catalogers who will take the initiative and appreciate um, the, the training being available. And for those that um, haven't shown the initiative, we just have to um, take a different tact. Are there any particular types of mistakes that are most common? That might be getting too detailed for the discussion, okay. Ryan. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, you know, series is a is a big issue, um, which is why we took the trouble to um, develop the documentation that we did, um, yeah. and. I was wondering if it was like series or authorities or just general formatting yeah. of, of the records. Or all and of the above? All of the above. Um, missing the 999 field. Um, the, there's some folks that consistently do that. Um, so, yeah, it does run the gamut. But okay. overall, we just you know want catalogers to pay more attention to the quality of the records they're bring, bringing in and yeah. uh, make sure that they're making the necessary changes. Because we're seeing all sorts of um, cataloging inconsistency through bringing records from Z39.52. Uh, so just the ability to recognize what's a good record and what's a bad record and, you know, choosing and um, and then correcting um, all our issues. So we're just, uh, basically, we want to just keep increasing um, the training level of our catalogers. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, shall we move on to the circulation committee? Yes, the circulation committee did not meet. Um, I'm going to be scheduling a meeting in April um, because it's been too long since they met, and I'm looking for somebody to take on chair responsibilities for that committee. Okay. All right. Perry, would you like to talk about budget stuff? Um, yeah, if we're going to do that, you want the, the budget proposal and everything uh, now? Well, I figure the budget committee, and if you want to present that as part of it, or if you want to do that separately at the end, I would leave that up to you. Yeah, let me do the budget proposal um, all together with this okay. strategic planning report. Okay. Okay. So does the budget committee itself have a report then? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, courier committee. Is there a courier committee? Have they met? Courier committee has not met either. And so they will be okay. also having a meeting in April. And I'm looking for a chair for that committee as well. Okay. A couple things that we need to um, look at. Um, on the committee and and we can talk about it obviously here um, the we currently have two drop sites in in Pendleton um, one at the ESD and one at BMCC and the load has been so high that we've been approached by Orbis Cascade um, to increase them from two days to five days um, 
we have enough money um, allocated in the budget and um, LSTA funding to do that. Um, so that will be a change that we'll most likely implement at the beginning of the new fiscal year. Um, another thing that we're needing to make a change on is um, Klamath. Um, right now, all materials going to Klamath come through EOU. Um, and that's slowing down the transit times because it has to go through more courier hops to get to Klamath. So um, we looked into uh, making them an Orbis Cascade drop site, but um, the cost is significant. Uh, so what we're going to try first, um, because we don't know what the demand is going to be once the um, delivery is quicker, we're going to look at giving um, drop sites the ability to click and ship um, or mail things directly to Klamath, unless I get objection from the council in approving that line of thought. So that would mean that, for example, Oregon Trail would click and ship to Klamath like they do to us instead of sending them to Eastern? Um, yes, that's what I'm proposing. And of course, that would be paid for by SAGE. Because we don't click and ship to anybody right now. You do not. OK, thanks. Hmm. Interesting. So libraries that are represented here today, do you think that that would be a problem? I, this is Kathy. I see that it could cause some confusion among my staff. Um, and we don't, if just getting them to the post office would be sort of a awkward how that would work. But that being said, we don't get things that often from Klamath, maybe once a month. So. Well, this would be things that they would request potentially from you. Though. Right. So, yeah. But or we would return someone from our library request from Klamath. We'd have to return it that way. Yeah. Not necessarily, it. isn't it? Just a time issue. So if returning, it can. So be that slower. would even get a little more confusing. Yeah. But I guess it would come up on the screen saying this would be a click and ship, instead of I don't know how that works since we don't do that. Um, Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, this, is, this is this is a proposal, and maybe what we need yeah. to do is is send out a uh, questionnaire um, to see see whether that's going to be a hardship for issues. And if it is, then um, Marcia and I will have to look at other alternatives. I mean, I think it's worth a try to see if it works. It'd be an easy alternative that, to get things to them faster. Would, would this be a matter of would this be a matter of sending out some sort of login information to create the labels? Yes. Or okay. yes, it would. So mm -hmm. There's no reimbursing. We just go online and print out a shipping label and stick it on a box and throw the yeah. books in the box. And, and at in. my end, what I do is I set up all the accounts um, and I enter the uh, the the Sage credit card. And um, of course, it's not viewable by anybody. Um, right. in their click and ship account, but it would um, allow things to be charged to the account. Yeah. And we and would need scales? Or is that not relevant anymore? Um, you would need a scale, yes. Okay. And it used to be, we've, we've done this in the past, um, and so I don't know how many of those scales are still floating around. We're just trying to provide a, uh, a better access to materials for Klamath. Yeah. So this is an idea that we had. Yeah, that's a good idea, I think, a good, a good option. So everybody needs to go to their local Walmart or equivalent and buy a kitchen scale. And <laughs> <laughs> And make a trip to the post office once a week. 
Well, and, and if this is a hardship, um, if, if a library doesn't already have a scale, um, we could look at using some courier funds to, to purchase one on their behalf. It's something we've done in the past. Um, so it's an idea. Okay. I, I don't think it would be that much of a problem here um, in LeGrand. We don't have to go to the post office ourselves anyway. We just take everything to City Hall for outgoing mail, and City Hall has a standing pickup for us. You can get a scale, I think, for about $20, a digital scale. Yeah. So. Some small libraries, that is a hardship, $20. But they might already have one, some of the smaller libraries, because sometimes they're the ones that already are doing click and ship. So, well, and and it's possible that we could just do this at key key lending sites and not um, require all of the Everybody. smaller libraries to do click and ship. So I'll take a look at that and see. Um, I can look at the history of, of what Klamath has typically borrowed, and it could be that we could just um, limit it to the Orbis Cascade drop sites. Okay. So I'll do some more research, but I just wanted to run it by the council today. Okay. Cool. It's, all right. So are we to the strategic planning committee now then? I think. Perry? Sure. All right. So uh, the strategic planning slash budget committee subcommittee met on January 30th. And uh, I, I had uh, prior to that, uh, online survey about pricing satisfaction uh, which I'll send a link to um, we had 16 respondents to that survey and the preferences um, were for uh, pricing by by population primarily uh, most people were satisfied with their pricing um, the pricing per capita cost disparity was a major concern for many of them um, so let me switch over to the sage budget and see. Okay, can an, everyone see my screen with the proposed budget? Yeah, it's the one you sent out to. Yes. So, okay. Let me go up to the top. Um, just some generalities. The proposed budget involves a six and a half percent general rate increase to all members and that's primarily to cover personnel costs due to spikes in PERS which is going up by 23 percent uh, health insurance is going up by seven percent and other major factor is the uh, adjustment in the tiers for this previous year creating that intermediary pricing uh, tier for populations 4,000 to 7,500. A couple of libraries fell into that, which we weren't ex really expecting. We just thought there would be one. Um, and each of those price drops was a $4,500 uh, reduction. Uh, so that's about a $9,000 revenue loss that we needed to make up. So you'll see that um, the membership dues to be collected uh, for this coming year, so 214,000 is basically about the same as the what we started out uh, with our target for a membership dues last year. So that's not, even uh, with the increases that I mentioned, that total collection of membership dues is really not uh, 
significant increase at all. It's negligible. Um, our cash carryover is um, reducing from our current position. Uh, we started this last this year with uh, 201,000. We're spending out of that. Um, some of that is due to um, the credit member credits payout, and some of it is due to uh, collecting less than our operations budget. So we may be dipping into our reserve. So I'm reducing that uh, a little bit to start this next year. The uh, career grant has increased uh, slightly to $58,000 from 55. Uh, so our total projected resources will be 469,000. Uh, well, just one note, um, the other revenues, um, there's a slight amount that we recover from members who use the OCLC CAT Express for cataloging. Um, we collected 1200 in 1718. Uh, don't have uh, payments on that for this current year. So we should get about $1,500 this next year for that. And that's just a pass through. Um, the consumer price index shows inflation rated at about 3%. So um, the projection for the uh, system's admin salary assumes a 3% cost of living increase. So the total on that will be 60900 This column that shows a change just shows 2% from the approved budget for this year. That's because we approved the budget uh, also assuming a 3% increase, but we actually only um, provided a 2%. So that's that 1% difference there. Um, the accountant for Baker, um, ours should cost about $6,000. So total salaries, 66900 Retirement PERS, as I mentioned, is um, going into a new biennium with a 23% increase. So raising from 13,800 to 16,900. Social Security is about the same. Uh, our health insurance, we were notified, uh, will be increasing by 7% for the district coverage. So re increasing from 7,700 to 8,200. Um, this isn't a big dollar amount, but a big percentage increase from previous years. The unemployment insurance rate has really spiked um, for reasons unknown from the state. So um, 17, 18, we we're paying around $70. Um, that's going up to 250 projected this year, 267 for this projected year. So total personnel services, 97,600. And that's a 5.5% increase from the current year budget. Um, materials and services costs, there's not um, a lot of big changes. So some, some reductions. Technology, we had budgeted 7,000 last year or for the current year. Dropping that to 4,500, that includes development money and some for um, software upgrades for Equinox contracting. Uh, the admin services fee, now this is um, calculated based on 2% of the total fund, and then we take out uh, what the salary for accounting hours are, um, and then what's left over is paid to Baker as an administrative fee. So this last year was 3600 for that. Um, I um, looked at that formula more closely, and we weren't including PERS costs in, in that reduction. So I've reduced the fee by about $1,500, um, accounting for that. So it's that's the... Uh, reason that's dropping. Um, and that comes to about an average of 
one hour per week would be my time, probably a bit less than that if we include the benefits calculations. System support, this is um, our contracted John George position. That also includes a 3% cost of living increase. So that's 63,600. Authority control is the same. Um, other change here is office supplies. We had allocated 1,500 this year. Uh, we're dropping that to 400. Um, training professional development, we have had at 5,000. We're dropping that to 2,500. Uh, LSTA grants the pass-through. We project um, SAGE courier portion of courier funding to be 35,000 for total courier cost for the year of 93,000. And reserves, we have a capital outlay reserve of 25,000. Um, the operations reserve of 135,000, which we need to operate until we collect the member fees, which leaves the balance of unappropriated contingency at 36,000. Any questions? I haven't been paying attention to chat. There was one question about where the breakdown for the individual library fees was, and I pointed them to the fee okay. schedule tab. Okay. Right. Look down at the bottom of your screen. You'll see the fee, the different tabs. There's one for fee schedule. Um, there's one for fee history over the years. Um, there's um, the F, the fiscal year 1819 um, spreadsheet for uh, that's the current fiscal year for, for quarter and for month and uh, also for the prior fiscal year. Uh, so if the council is concerned of this six and a half percent increase is um, too much to assess to members, um, we could s reduce that rate by spending down our um, contingency fee of 36,000. So to drop that down to uh, 3%, that would get us uh, $207,000, which um, leaves us about $6,000 uh, in the hole to cover our operating expenses. And we'd, so we'd, we drop our contingency down to 30000 Any discussion about that? Which would you like? Uh, Anne is still looking for the, the well, fee keep, schedules. It's going to be confusing because I've been changing that percentage. Sorry, Anne. Let me put it back to six and a half. So Perry, I have a quick question for you. This is Dia. Mm -hmm. I know you talked about having some conversation about various ways of changing um, the fee structure. Um, right. Did you have that conversation at that budget committee meeting? Yeah, we did. did. Um, and there was a lot of support for going more towards a, a proration based more on population, but there was also quite a bit of support for using other metrics like uh, usage data or um, a member's budget. So we were going to um, take this next year because we couldn't come up with a new pricing structure for the budget cycle for this year. This next year we'll work on some different formula combinations 
to um, present and think about. Um, Harry, this is Kathy. Weren't we also going to reach out to some other consortiums and see maybe what formula they used? Because a couple of the options seemed, the, upon closer examination, to be perhaps at, when you first think about it, you're like, oh, okay, the number of library card holders is how we base it. But then if you think about it, if you're a small town and you have a new family move in with seven members, that might push you into the next bracket. So you'd say, oh, why don't you just get one family car? You know, those sorts of things could happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then basing it on revenue could, what were the, one of the things the committee was worried was um, then a city per library perhaps could say, well, if your revenue was less, then your SAGE membership your would be less. Right. So that was one of the reasons the committee thought we could reach out to some other uh, um, consortiums and get perhaps models of what they're using and look at this in the coming year. So the only one we've reached out to and gotten feedback from, Aaron Wells contacted the uh, Link the Clackamas Consortium, and their costs are not actually distributed to the member libraries for their ILS, but they're covered by the county general fund. Right. When they do have assessments uh, for shared databases, they distrib distribute those costs based on percentage of population served mostly. And in some cases, they'll use a combination of population served and usage. So that's the only one that we've checked with and had feedback from. Seems like the more you look into it and the more options, it, it, it yeah. gets to be a very murky um, idea. Going to a more uh, a more population proration system is going to be a significant change. So we'll have to figure out how to ramp up to that over the years with as little distress and disruption to our yeah. members. And some libraries are going to see a big increase, and some of them are going to see a decrease with those proposals. Thanks for explaining that, Ray. I like that you have it all laid out here, too. But it is. It is a. So the council does need to vote to approve the proposed budget with a, I think, either the 6.5% increase or to use a payout of the contingency and reduce that rate. Okay. Could you describe what kinds of things the contingency might be needed for so that we have a fair idea of that as well? Um, yeah, I think Beth could better address that. I think you know, it could be a massive hardware failure needing to replace servers. Um, yeah, it if, could be a legal. If we were, we were to have a data breach, it could be our portion of legal expenses. So the current contingency that's there, how much of that of either of those kinds of scenarios might that cover? Or how far off are we from? I really don't know. I would just be guessing. Right. Yeah, same here. Um, because we haven't had to dip into contingency before, um, the things I think of are system failure and having, you know, an emergency situation where we're having to, to uh, get more help from Equinox and pay for additional hours. Um, uh, hardware replacement, those kind of things. Worst case, worst case scenario kind of things. If we were to lose both Beth and John for some reason, we'd be contracting out support probably with Equinox or some service like that. Yes. And those hours aren't cheap. Very quickly. No, but um, what they would do is is work out some kind of. Uh, 
agreement with the consortium for you know half a year on um, unlimited support for such and such a dollar um, so it wouldn't be like we are now um, having to pay per hour they would negotiate some kind of contract um, to get sage through um, through any kind of loss like that This is Deneen in Enterprise, and because I'm on the front desk, I might have missed something. Um, what is the reason why we don't want to just do the six and a half percent? Why would we take it out of contingency? Is there is that are there people who can't afford that? Um, that was my concern, Deneen. I wanted to give the option. Um, I know that um, from time to time, you know, libraries are struggling. And so I, I just didn't want us to be in a situation where members were having to back out of SAGE um, because of the cost increase. Well, that does make sense. But as one of the smaller libraries, um, my increase is $96. So, I mean, if I had to, I could not get four books and make that up. So I, I would make a motion that we vote for the budget with the 6.5% increase. This is Kathy. I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, hearing no opposition, I assume the motion is passed. Um, and we'll send that out to the membership for notification for their budget planning for next year. All right. Yeah, I can take care of putting it up on the website and uh, letting members know. Yeah. And, and as a reason to show up and vote the next time for people who didn't make it in today. So, all right. Uh, was there any other business today? Yes. Um, Cheryl had okay. wanted to talk oh, about Burns right. High School. Burns. Right. Cheryl? Oh, and I can oh, help no out mic. Cheryl since she has no mic. <laughs> so um, there's so two schools in... Um, their district are a part of SAGE um, and Burns High School is slowly moving towards it. So um, she would like to know whether um, we need to get formal council approval of the possibility of Burns coming, Burns High School joining and also whether all three schools could be charged as a district rather than individually. Um, the thing that's different about Burns High School um, library coming in is that there would n be no conversion um, because they're basically starting from scratch. So it would just be a matter of uh, um, ordering barcodes and starting to add them to the system. So uh, the uh, we don't have to worry about the quality of records and um, the possibility of duplication. So those are two, two favorable differences with this addition. Just because I'm curious, uh, are the other two schools and the high school a district in and of themselves in Burns? Like in LeGrand, we have the high school and the middle school and the three elementary schools and they're the LeGrand school district. Yeah. And Cheryl. I see Cheryl said yes. Yep. So, so, um, and are the two that are here already built as separate entities, or are they built as one library now? They have. They also have nine rural school districts um, too. Wow. So, but all these libraries involved are a part of the same district. Okay. 
Cheryl, would this include the ESD as well? Because right now they're billed separately too. Okay. And so, she says that the two no. that are part of it now are billed separately. Yes. So I have a question. Do we have any um, current sites that are like in a district kind of a situation or are they all individual or do we even have scenarios similar? Um, there, there was, um, we did provide a quote to the Ontario school district um, when they were looking at putting their elementary schools um, as a part of SAGE. Um, so um, they opted to choose different software because of the personnel involved. Um, so that that didn't come to fruition, but we have considered the possibility before. So we don't currently have a situation that would mean that we decide one way or another because we've had that situation? No. No, currently Ontario is uh, paying separate for the middle school and the high school. Because the elementaries did not um, choose to join SAGE. Are any of the problematic cataloging libraries, uh, school libraries, would this increase our potential problems in that area? Um, no. Okay. I, I don't personally have any objection to them joining. Um, so Do we uh, come up with any kind of a policy or a plan for when we add? And we had this conversation many times, and I don't know if we've ever. We did, and in, in the past, we um, we there was a form that was filled out um, when Slater and Heinz um, were being considered, and so we could do that. Um, to stay with the, the formal process and, and basically that was just to determine if there were going there was a need for um, assessing them additional charges because of conversion costs and time on my end um, for the conversion those types of things we wanted to make sure that they were addressed um, as a part of the membership but there's no conversion. Time. But there's no conversion. Uh, so this is kind of a special case. I think there still should be a, a formal procedure of uh, submitting to the council with, you know, some specifications as to what assets they're bringing, what the conversion costs would be. We could just say none in this case, but <laughs> I would like that to be laid out in a document for the council to see and approve or not. I would agree. I think we need to continue with the standard. Okay. I agree. This, Kathy, I agree with that too. All right. Well, Cheryl and I can work on getting that together for um, the next council meeting. So I'm assuming if this is approved by the council, then they would begin um, in the new fiscal year? Or are we looking for another year out? Oh, I would think it would be um, the new fiscal year or sooner. And what um, tier would they be under? The schools greater than 500 or less than? The two existing would combine to make a greater than 500. So if we're adding in a third one, they would all together definitely be in the greater than 500. She said it was Slater Elementary and Heinz Middle, and together they make up a little over 600 students. And if we're adding a third one and billing them as one entity, it would. Yeah. Um, what we had determined as far as public libraries, if there was a district that all of the branches and the district would be billed as one, do we want to consider school districts of the same It's just a thought. I was just thinking of the correlation between 
Yeah, I think if they're all under the same ESD, they should be charged as a district. Okay. ESDs sometimes are multi-school district. Um, just saying. Yeah, and the, like, this ESD is not a part of it, so, right. yeah. It but, would be okay, school, so, go ahead. Be school district, because I know, like in Condon, we had the Gillum County School District, or the Condon School District and the Arlington School District. They're both in the same county, but they're different districts. But they are all Condon, Sherman, Wheeler are covered by the same ESD. So saying a same ESD district wouldn't work in my, I don't know. Okay. No, it would have to be a school school district. Okay. Yeah, whatever we decide, <clears throat> we would have to look at how that would impact our current uh, subscribers. If we're going to group some, would that mean that some of our current members could also be conglomerated into one? And how would that impact our Revenue. Well, and, and my question too, Beth, you just mentioned, you know, district. And so, okay, I know that we're a little bit different in terms of the Umatilla County. We receive one bill, but each entity is billed separately in terms of their fee structure. Yes, and so, that, yeah, you guys are unique that, because it's a it's that, a special oh, library. Or would it be? Do you see what I'm saying? But on the other hand, isn't Baker a special district also, and they have branches? Do you see what I'm saying? There's, there's kind of a, what you're saying. I hear. I just yeah. want to make sure that I'm understanding the same way that you're speaking, and that we all are. I think that billing question is a good point. If we're billing the individual libraries, then they should be charged as individual libraries. If they're if the payment is coming from one central source, then I thought that's it how had it to organized. do with the the governance issue and the I don't know. We made a distinction at the time when we came up with this. Well, I just want to make sure whatever we decide that we're all on the same page understanding. That's that's the reason I asked the question. I'm not trying to sway things. I just am curious. Perry, do you remember the reasoning why that the Umatilla Special Library District was considered as individual libraries? I don't remember the phrases or it the, was you know, because they about. are all individual libraries. Yeah, they're governed they're, um, separately. Summer City, they're all individual city libraries and governed separately. I think that's why. They all have their own separate budgets. So yeah. are they but, sort right. of are they sort of well are they basically the same as the individual library organizations within Sage? Like Sage governs all of us but we all govern ourselves in Umatilla County Special Library District they're a group for certain things but they're separate for other things yeah okay and in Baker's case Baker is just one unified single entity with branches mm -hmm. okay and for system support you're not going to be dealing with one central unit in these. You're going to be dealing with each individual site. I think that's right. an important distinction as well. Yeah, that's true. However we decide, I just don't want us to shortchange ourselves in the long run, one direction or the other. That's the reason I asked the questions. No, they're good questions to ask. Okay, well, we can work on this between um, this meeting and the next one. This is Deneen again, and I have looked all over the budget. I can't find Joseph. Uh, well, they should be there.
Maybe someone else can find it and tell me where. I don't see it either. How did Joseph get up, get missing from our spreadsheet? I, don't know. It, I kind of panicked. I thought, well, did they drop? But I think I'd know that. <laughs> yes, you would. Well, then that means that means there's going to be more money, and maybe we don't need six <laughs> percent. <laughs> there would be a, a little bit. <laughs> maybe it would be worth going through and making sure all of our libraries are on this. We got a prize. Wallawa Public. I'm sorry, Wallawa. did you ask me a question? No, he, no. Was, he was just reviewing the list of Wallawa County libraries that. Wallawa are. County, which dropped. We've got Wallawa Public, we've got Enterprise. I think that's it. Well. We definitely need Joseph back in there. Interesting. Well, we all know with spreadsheets, when you make changes, things just happen sometimes. Yes. Well, I wonder how long they've been missing, probably for a long time. No. Barry, we're still going to make you do the spreadsheet when <laughs> this was your attempt to get out of it. <laughs> no way. Um, Perry, I know that they were in last year because I did, I did charge them a membership fee, so. <laughs> they just dropped somewhere a long way at this time. All right. Okay, so I think, I think we've reached a stopping point in the discussion about Harney for now. Did, did we want to take a vote on yes or no about them joining and a vote on yes or no about billing them together or separately at this time, or do you want to wait for? Um, we're doing that at the next meeting unless there's uh, okay. a need to do it in between the meetings, Ryan. Okay, all right. Was there any other business that anybody had today to discuss? Just a heads up, this is Kathy, and I'm on the Association of Rural and Small Libraries Board. And mm -hmm. if you're planning to attend that conference this year, we're expecting um, the conference registrations to sell out quite fast. And we have no availability for extra people, and it's fewer rooms than last year. So um, if you want to go, there's a scholarship that just came out from the state yesterday. They're giving 10 fully paid scholarships to attend, and it's in um, Vermont. Burlington, Vermont this year. And so when it do the state simple application if you want to go, and when the um, openings start on April 10th, don't hesitate to sign up if you are wanting to go. Okay. I did actually fill out that application this morning myself. Good job. It doesn't, it's it doesn't a take great, too long. No, and, and it's, it's a, a great conference. Um, conference. There's a lot of good information to bring back to yeah. libraries our size. It's just yeah. wonderful. I went when they were in Tacoma three or four years ago, I feel like. I think maybe four. Last year uh, was Springfield, Illinois, and the year before that was um, Utah, and the year before that was Fargo. It was so. very good. I was not and impressed. Then, by the oh, hotel staff. Oh, yeah. And then next year we'll be in Kansas, and the year after that we'll be in the Pacific Northwest. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Now I'll take a look. Um, Dewey it's came up with a good, a good idea. Um, we haven't talked about our annual meeting, and that's typically in May, oh. which would be our next meeting. So um, we need to be thinking about that. Okay. And that's general a general membership meeting. Yes, it is. 
So we no need to look for a hosting site as uh, as well as um, determining a date. So okay. maybe maybe the best way to do that is to send out an email um, asking for volunteers to host. Okay, uh, I can do that and get locations and date ranges, and then create a survey, and we'll pick a location and date range that works the best, or date that works the best. If if that works for everybody that does it does okay okay so i'll send a, a fill in the blank survey for people to volunteer to host and to put in a date when they can host if they want to and then we'll send out another survey to pick one so okay thank you everybody thanks ryan yeah. You're welcome. Somebody want to formally adjourn the meeting for the day? I move that we adjourn the meeting. Right. Can I second things as the chair? No. Oh, well, then does anybody Happy, want to I'll second, second that? All right. <laughs> oh, good job, Mark. Anybody opposed? No. Okay. Anybody? All right. We'll see you all next time then. Bye. Have a good week. Thanks, everyone.